It's a very poignant day to be here in Belfast to commemorate the hunger strikers of 1981. It's special because this is the first time in three years we've been able to do this. It's special because we're going to go to Milltown Cemetery where three of the hunger strikers are buried. Bobby Sands, Joe McDonald and Kieran Doherty. And for us from Monaghan, and there's a huge crew from Cavan Monaghan here today because of course Kieran Doherty was a TD for that constituency. A phenomenal achievement at the time and a vindication of that the fact that Kieran and Bobby, who was elected as MPs, were considered by the Irish people to be political prisoners. The people supported the prisoners' demands and they resisted against attempts by the British government of the time to criminalise them. So we're here today, we're buoyant, we're absolutely proud to commemorate those who gave their lives for Irish freedom and we're very confident of the fact that we are on the road to Irish unity, that we are on the road to the Republic. So I just think it's amazing and fantastic to see such a crowd here in Belfast and it's great to be able to tell the world that the Irish Republic and hunger strikers are still remembered with pride. How much boil you had, Shaw, and you, the Kibnu, or our guardians, our comrade had, a fur boss, or stock up, reach the cash at it, and EJ got to a hand. Kibnu, Mitch, Kumai, or Michael Gahanogus, Frank Stagg, a fur boss, a Brisbane assassinate, instant Shakuji. You're all very welcome to Belfast today as we mark the 41st anniversary of our friends and comrades who sacrificed their lives in the cause of Irish freedom in the hate blocks long cache in 1981. I particularly want to extend a warm welcome to the families of the hunger strikers who are with us today. This year also marks the 46th anniversary of the death of Frank Stagg and the 48th anniversary of Michael Gohan's death, both of whom died on hunger strike in English prisons. 2022 is also the centenary of the Irish Civil War, a tragedy for the Irish nation. Republicans saw hopes of a free, united and socially just Ireland dashed. Thousands suffered imprisonment. 77 Republicans were executed officially in free state prisons. Many more were murdered on the outside. But despite all of that, the Irish Republican ideal survived and endured. There would be another day. Less than 50 years later, a new risen generation in the North breathed new life into that ideal. And the hunger strikers in Long Cash were exemplars of that generation. They were the generation that decided it was no longer an option to accept meekly the naked sectarianism, supremacism, discrimination and brutality of the Unionist regime and the British government and its military. We witnessed in our young lives the pogroms of 1969, the violent response of the state to civil rights protests, imprisonment without trial or due process, British Army massacres in Derry, the new lodge Ballamurphy, Spring Hill, the hunger strikers, like many of my generation, decided that armed resistance was the only way to bring about change. And subsequently, thousands of young Irish men and women ended up in prison, where we asserted our right to be treated as political prisoners. After a lengthy hunger strike in 1972, the British government conceded special category status, which was political status in everything but name. However, within a short space of time after that, the British began to roll out its new criminalisation strategy. They instructed their diplomats throughout the world to portray the conflict in Ireland as some sort of criminal conspiracy and began using terminology and vocabulary associated with criminality when referring to our struggle and the people involved in the struggle. The British also decreed that no one would qualify for special category status after the 1st of March 1976 and all prisoners of whatever stripe would have to integrate and conform, wear a prison uniform and do menial and degrading prison work. The Brits thought that if they could force Republican prisoners 
to accept criminal status, it would drive a wedge between them and the communities who supported them. They thought they would then isolate, marginalise and ultimately defeat our struggle. And the front line of this battle was to be played out in the H blocks and Armagh Women's Prison, which our enemies thought would be the breakers' yards for Irish Republican prisoners of war. The upshot of this confrontation was over five years of prison protest. First the blanket protest that escalated to the no-wash protest and ultimately the hunger strikes of 1980 and 1981. Brutality, beatings and deprivation were the order of the day and we believed the only way we could bring the situation to a head was by having a hunger strike. Some will ask if there was not an alternative to hunger strike and the answer is yes, there was an alternative. The British government could have ended its vicious and vindictive criminalisation strategy and the prison regime could have stopped the beatings, the brutality and the torture of naked and defenceless prisoners. They didn't. They didn't because they, could, they thought they could defeat and break us. They thought we would bend the knee, that we would eventually capitulate to their torture and brutality. That we would, would accept the criminalisation of our struggle against the Orange State and the British government. But they were wrong. The British hadn't factored into their strategy the centuries of prison resistance that was part of the psyche and DNA of Irish Republicans. From the Fenians in the 19th century to Thomas Ashe and Terence McSweeney in the early 20th century, Irish Republicans held in free state prisons during the Civil War. Sean McCahey and his comrades in the 1940s through to Michael Gong and Frank Stagg in the 1970s. These were the unbowed and unbroken Irish Republicans who we in the H-Blocks and Armagh look to for inspiration. Bobby, as usual, got it right about the Brits when he said, never in eight centuries have they succeeded in breaking the spirit of one person who refused to be broken. To go on hunger strike is a massive decision, and it isn't just a question of whether or not you can see it through. I've always believed the hardest part was watching our families suffer as our conditions deteriorated and our bodies wasted away. So I want to pay tribute to all the families, especially those here today, for their, for their support and their great strength and dignity. <laughs> Given the enormity of the decision to go on hunger strike, and face almost certain death. Many people understandably want to know what motivated the men who died. And the best answer, I think, can be found in Bobby's poem, The Rhythm of Time. There's an inner thing in every one. Do you know this thing, my friend? It lies in the heart of heroes dead. It screams in Tarrant's eyes. It lights the dark of this prison cell it thunders forth its might. It is the undauntable thought, my friend, that thought that says, I'm right. Bobby, of course, was right. <laughs> Bobby, of course, was right, and the other hunger strikers were right. And they all went on hunger strike with their eyes wide open. Each would have received a communication from the leadership similar to the one I got when it was my turn to join the hunger strike. When I unwrapped the column, which was handwritten on two cigarette papers, the first thing I noticed was that it was addressed to volunteer Pat Sheehan. And it went on to say, you have volunteered to go on hunger strike and have been selected to replace volunteer Kieran Doherty. By embarking on this course of action, you will be bringing the movement into direct confrontation with the enemy. So if you have any second thoughts, stand aside now 
and nothing less will be thought of you. However, if you go ahead with your decision, you will be dead in two months. And it was as stark as that. I thought I had all the angles covered, but seeing in black and white that I would be dead in two months certainly rocked me back on my heels. But after gathering myself together, I wrote back and gave an assurance that I wouldn't let anyone down. I've never seen the responses of the men who died, but I imagine they all responded in their own ways in a similar fashion. It's important that we remember our comrades, not just as hunger strikers, but as the real people they were with their own personalities. Thomas McElwee was just 23 when he died. He had acquired the nickname Punchy in the blocks because of his absolute refusal to accept any ill treatment without fighting back. And on more than one occasion, he put screws on the flat of their backs. But there was also another side to Tom, a young fella full of fun and mischief. Callum Scullion, another blanket man from South Derry, I see here today with a blanket wrapped around him, wrote a chapter about Tom in the book, The Comrades, which was published last year as part of the 40th anniversary commemorations. In his contribution, Callum tells the story of how, when they were on remand, he happened to mention to Tom the name of a girl he fancied, but had never had the courage to ask out. Tom convinced him to write to her, promising that he would smuggle the letters out and bring back her replies. The romance blossomed as the correspondence increased until it eventually came to light that Callum's letters weren't leaving the prison and that it was actually Tom he was writing to. <laughs> Callum had fallen for one of Tom's mixes, but despite that they remained firm friends. In the same book, Dan Daly, another comrade and blanket man, wrote a chapter about Martin Hurson. And I didn't know Martin, I had never met him, but Dan gives us a glimpse into the character of the man. As the only prisoner in the wing in H5 not doubled up, Dan knew the next man coming into the wing would be going into the cell with him. And sure enough, when the shout went up that there was a new man on the wing, seconds later, Dan's door opened. Without hesitation, in strides Martin, hand outstretched and a big beaming smile on his face, introducing himself with a very firm handshake. Hello, I'm Martin Hurston, but they call me Hurston Boy, he said. You could instantly feel the energy from him, Dan tells us. He was full of life and full of crack and I knew at once that we would get on well together. Now when I hear Martin's name or see his picture, it's that image of him and Dan meeting for the first time that springs to my mind. Of course, all our comrades who died on hunger strike were multifaceted and multidimensional and all were highly regarded in their own communities. For those of us involved in the prison protest and the hunger strike, 1981 is like a bad dream, but it's also a period of struggle of which we can all be extremely proud. I was here at the Republican plot last summer making a video message for a GAA club in New York who were naming the, the road into their grounds the Bobby Sands Way. And I had my two daughters with me Bamba, who was nine, and Fola, five. And they were very patient as the filming was happening, and then they uh, eventually got fed up and started running around the headstones here playing. And I could hear them, I could hear them laughing and shouting. And the first thing that occurred to me was Bobby's uh, famous quote, our revenge will be the laughter of our children. However, as I sat beside the, the graves of Bobby, Joe and Cairn, and also Pat Bug McKeown, who's buried in the plot, who died prematurely as a result of complications uh, from the hunger strike, it struck me how lucky I had been to survive the hunger strike 
and come out of prison and have a family. Those of the lads who had children didn't get the opportunity to see them grow up and the others didn't have a chance to have a family. And to me that illustrates the enormity of the sacrifice that they made. In terms of the political impact of the hunger strike, we need to remember that the aim of criminalization was to defeat the Republican struggle. So how did that work out? The Orange State has gone, Unionist domination has gone, Sinn Féin is the biggest party in the North and on the island of Ireland. <clears throat> and so the opposite of what was intended has come to pass. Criminalisation was defeated and the injustice of partition and the British state in Ireland was exposed to international scrutiny as never before. By their heroism and sacrifice, the hunger strikers ensured that the cause of Irish freedom was renewed and that now in 2022 we are closer than ever to undoing the injustice of partition and reuniting our country. Their bravery set in train a series of events that makes the momentum for political and social change unstoppable and irreversible. That momentum will carry us forward to the realisation of an Irish national democracy, a republic where the rights and identity of all our people, of whatever persuasion or background, will be accommodated and cherished. But the hunger strikers didn't die just to prove they were right. They had a vision, a belief and an idea that their suffering and deaths would lead to a better world for the rest of us. It's often said that there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And that time has come now. And let's all, together, finish the job. And just to conclude, Akarja, there are some traditions that believe that as long as a person's name is spoken, they will never be dead. And that's something that many Irish Republicans could identify with. So today here at the Republican plot, this sacred place in Belfastia, we loudly and proudly speak the names of Michael Gohan, Frank Stagg, Bobby Sands, Francis Hughes, Patsy O'Hara, Raymond McCreesh, Joe McDonnell, Martin Horson, Kevin Lynch, Keir Doherty, Tom McElwee, Mickey Devine. <laughs> they were sons and brothers. Some were husbands and fathers. Their families loved them and they in turn loved their families. Some of them were Gilligory. They were all valued members of their communities. Many were involved in the GAA. Some had been interned without trial. All of them had experienced brutality at the hands of the British state. They were blanket men, revolutionaries. All were political prisoners who died on hunger strike in British prisons. They were ordinary young men who resisted until their last breath. They are our hunger strikers and our heroes. Bur fear Kroga ate a leg, and Dram is Kroga or Fad, Agus Furshid Bas, or Son Sirsha Naharan. I am a proud young Irish man, no searches. My life began a happy boy Through green fields ran I kept God a man's laws But when my age was burdened My country's wrongs were told again by ten thousands marching men my heart stood to the cause so I wear no convicts uniform nor meet 
please serve my time Let Britain my Grand Island spy Eight hundred years of crime I read of centuries of strife Of cruel loss, injustice, right And I saw now in my own young life The fruits of foreign sway Protesters threatened, tortured, made the vision nurtured, passions flame, outrage provoked, rights causes defame, that is the conqueror's way. Why so were no convicts you need for, nor meekly serve my time. The Britain might and Ireland's fight, eight hundred years of crime. Descended from proud Connie's clan, from cannon serves, cruel Britain's plan, man's inhumanity. The man has spawned a trusty slave. No strangers are these bolts and locks, no new design, these dark edged blocks, black crumbled lips, wild mason stalks, the bully taunts the brave. So I were no convicts uniform, nor me please time of Britain my Grand Island's fight eight hundred years of crime does Britain need a thousand years of protests and riots and death and tears or will the last decade of fears of eighty decades spell an end to Ireland's agony you hope for human dignity or will the last of sanity be this grim death block cell so I uniform nor me please serve my time the Britain my Grand Ireland's fight eight hundred years of crime